trickling in as they pour their cups of coffee. And I uh, just want to welcome everybody to Rescuing History, Nantucket in response to rising seas. Um, I'm, my name is Mary Bergman, and I'm the executive director of the Nantucket Preservation Trust. The NPT is a nonprofit membership organization that advocates for the protection and preservation of Nantucket's historic resources, including our cultural and architectural heritage, our landscapes and streetscapes, and the island's unique sense of place. And this is our third such conference that looks at climate change and its relationship to our historic coastal community. The first year, uh, we worked with the University of Florida, University of Florida's Preservation Institute in Nantucket, they shared 3D visualizations of what sort of flooding scenarios we might be contending with in the next 30, 50 to 100 years. Uh, last year, we heard from hazard mitigation and preservation experts across the country who spoke about adaptations to both the built and the natural environment. And we learned that we would not just have to lift buildings, but we would have to shift our way of thinking. This year, we wanted to create some space for conversations relating to um, climate change mitigation. If we know that we're going to have to take some rather drastic measures to adapt buildings, what can we do to lessen the environmental impact? There are three major themes that we'll be exploring today and tomorrow, and that's construction and demolition waste and alternatives to mechanical demolition. So we'll be hearing from our folks at our landfill, RDPW, and, and other uh, construction and waste uh, programs throughout the country, how we can make older buildings more energy efficient, and tomorrow we'll be focusing a lot on uh, solar and energy in local historic districts and hearing from some homeowners who've gone ahead and made that change on their properties here in Nantucket. And all these issues are interconnected to one another. And they're really all about managing change, which is a big part of historic preservation. So we're hoping that these presentations generate discussion, which is not so easy to do in a virtual platform, but please use the chat and the Q&A and there'll be Q&A um, after each presentation, we're also recording all the sessions. So if you're not able to join us for everything, we'll be posting those on our YouTube page and emailing them out to all the attendees and then later to uh, all of everyone on our membership list. So if you have any technical concerns, you can met Sean Reardon is here to help and you can message Nantucket Preservation Trust on the uh, chat and he'll help you. And we're so grateful for the community support we've received from members and local businesses and organizations who helped make this conference possible. We're grateful to all the speakers who are joining us over the next couple of days. And we're especially thankful for the funding support from the Community Foundation for Nantucket's Remain Nantucket Fund and all of our leadership supporters who are listed up on our website. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Nathaniel Green, who's the Senior Renewable Energy Advocate Climate and Clean Energy Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Nathaniel specializes in researching, analyzing, and influencing pol policies related to renewables. Within the broad category of renewable energy, he has expertise in wind power, solar power, biofuels, biopower, emergent clean technologies such as batteries and fuel cells, and the interaction of renewables and wildlife. He also understands the relationship among these technologies and the state and federal laws and regulations that can either promote or inhibit them. He holds a bachelor's degree in public policy from Brown University and a master's in energy resources from the University of California, Berkeley. And he's a longtime Nantucket summer seasonal resident. So we're so thrilled to have him here and please join me in welcoming Nathaniel Green. Thanks, Mary. Um, I'd uh, also like to thank Michelle Whalen, who introduced me to Mary, and the whole uh, Nantucket Preservation Trust team uh, for hosting this really important symposium, and to remain and the, all the members and other folks that underwrote it. Um, as Mary said in her kind introduction, uh, my name is Nathaniel Green. My great grandparents built the Wade Cottages out in Sconset, um, and uh, my grandmother, my father, uh, myself, my kids, we've all grown up um, out there. Uh, I'm a senior renewable energy advocate at the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. For those of you who don't know us, NRDC is an international nonprofit dedicated to protecting the natural systems on which all life depends. We're about 700 lawyers, scientists, doctors, economists, policy experts, fighting for everyone's right to clean air, clean water, safe food, and thriving communities. We have 3 million members and online activists and offices across the US 
been in Beijing and a growing presence in India. Let's see, I can get my slide started now. Um, usually when I give these sorts of talks, my punchline, no matter what technology I'm talking about, uh, uh, my request to the audience is to vote. It's almost, it's the most powerful thing we can do as citizens. We must go to the polls and vote for the changes in laws and policies that we want. Anyone who tells you we're gonna solve climate change by reducing our individual carbon footprint, just by putting solar on your roof or something like that, is distracting you from your real power as a voter. Today, however, I wanna ask you to do something more than just vote. I want you to use your imagination. Imagine how climate change is already impacting you and those who hold most dear. Maybe if you leave, live near the wildfires out west or have family displaced by the flooding in Louisiana or New Jersey or New York, maybe then you don't have to imagine. These days, hardly a week goes by when we're not confronted with pictures in the paper and on TV of people around the world suffering or dying from extreme weather events that the climate models have been predicting for decades. But when you're standing on the hard, dry cobblestones at the top of Main Street, surrounded by all the comforts that Nantucket has to offer, it's easy to see those people and their suffering is a long way off. So let's use our imagination to feel in our bones that those people could be our friends, our loved ones, or ourselves. This will give us the motivation to act. I fight climate change because I want my daughters to have all the opportunities to see all the wonders that I've seen and it's all too easy to imagine a world where they can't have those things. Next, let's use our imagination to see how fighting climate change fits into the mission of those institutions we're already part of. For inspiration, we need look no further than the Nantucket Preservation Trust and this thoughtful symposium. What does it mean to rescue history when a change in climate threatens to put parts of our island underwater? But what about your church? or your local school board, or your favorite museum? Can you see how climate change is already impacting them and how we can make climate, change, climate action part of their agenda? Then we can leverage action beyond ourselves, beyond our votes. So we are motivated and we have beads. Now we just need to act. The solutions to the climate crisis are at hand. We need to deploy them at a scale that will change everything. They will change the way that we live. They will change the beautiful and historic buildings that we love, maybe on the outside, but certainly on the inside, as I'll discuss. Change is coming either way. If we don't act, climate change will change everything. But if we use our imagination, we can shape the solutions, implementing them thoughtfully and preserving the essence of what we love. To understand the solutions, we first need to understand the problem. Many of you probably read about the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report. I think the UN Secretary General put it most succinctly when he said, today's IPCC report is a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. Global heating is affecting every region of, on Earth, and many of the changes are becoming irreversible. If we're going to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. By 2030, we need to eliminate about half of our emissions, and by 2050, we basically need to be at zero. And here in the US, that overwhelmingly means cleaning up our energy sector. To greatly simplify the story and focus on what's most relevant to us here today, there are two big levers we need to pull. We need to generate our electricity cleanly from renewables, and we need to shift everything we can to electricity. That means closing dirty old coal and gas power plants and replacing them primarily with wind and solar. I'm gonna talk more about that in a few minutes, but I wanna talk first about electrification. 
This may seem like a digression from today's topic, but what a shame to put a solar panel on a home and then not get the most benefit from it. In fact, if we don't get the most benefit from it, we make our job doubly hard, probably impossible. How we use energy is every bit as important as what type of energy we use. Electrification means rather than burning natural gas or oil or propane in our homes and offices, we shift to electric appliances. And rather than burning gasoline or diesel in our cars and trucks, we shift to electric cars and batteries. In other words, at the same time we talk about how we integrate more solar on Nantucket, we need to ask, what would an electrified Nantucket look like? And while we're making this transition, we need to remember that the cheapest, cleanest, fastest solution to, climate, to the climate crisis is always energy efficiency. So let's talk about the solutions in reverse order, efficiency, electrification, and then renewables. That way, we end talking about the focus of the symposium, solar. The classic example of energy efficiency is the light bulb. My father was an early adopter of the compact fluorescent bulb. They use just one quarter of the electricity compared to an incandescent bulb, and they last many times longer. If you remember changing an incandescent bulb just after it burned out and burning your fingertips, then you have a clear sense of how much electricity was wasted producing heat instead of light. That said, I remember years of turning lights on at home and having to wait for the CFL to warm up and then thinking that everything looked a little green or blue. It took some time and some imagination to figure out where compact fluorescence made sense and where they didn't. Then along came LEDs, instant on, and they dim, and they use just a fraction of the electricity of a CFL, and they last for years. At first, I remember having to guess if they would be warm white or daylight blue, but now we have more choices than ever. Thanks to LEDs, my daughter's room often looks like a dance club. And recently, when we spent a week on Tuckernuck, we ate by three faux candles, each of which was powered by just two AA batteries. And the batteries lasted all week. I'm not suggesting everyone live by electric candlelight, but you must admit it's more historically accurate. And it was lovely. Refrigerators are another great example of efficiency. Today's units have more space inside, use dramatically less electricity, and they cost less. Note that much of these gains were driven by energy efficiency standards. So if you're looking at this chart, the size is the red line going up. And you can see that the refrigerators have just gotten bigger and bigger since the 1950s. The blue, is the energy use. And you can see those went up pretty much in lockstep until about the early 70s, mid 70s. And then with energy efficiency standards, those are marked on the blue line with the arrows coming into effect. The energy use went, fell down like off a cliff and the green line is the cost. So not only were they getting more efficient, they were getting cheaper. These are energy efficiency standards are policies. These are things that are driven by your votes. And refrigerators has given us technologies that can help electrify heating and cooling in our homes much more efficiently. Heat pump technology is more commonly known as mini split systems or ductless air conditioning. It allows us to use electricity efficiently where before we needed expensive, loud, and dirty combinations of window air conditioners, gas, oil, or propane boilers. When I was a kid, the idea of air conditioning on Nantucket was sort of an oxymoron. The whole point of coming here was to enjoy the cool sea air, but tastes change and summers have been getting hotter. So now we need to ask, what keeps the historic look and feel better? A window mounted AC unit rattling away or a mini split system hidden behind a trellis in the back? The next big area for electrification, innovation, and adaptation is the inductive range. This isn't the electric stovetop of your youth. Your pans heat up fast and precisely, and magically, you don't have to worry about burning yourself on the range top. I'm told by real cooks that they they're really uh, 
the best way to cook. What about transportation sector? As you can see, transportation is currently the largest source of climate pollution, just edging out electricity. Fortunately, it turns out that electric vehicles are just inherently more efficient. More energy in an electric car's battery can be turned into movement. More of the energy in a tank of gas gets wasted as heat. But the challenge has been storing enough energy in batteries, range anxiety. It makes sense that EVs would take off in Nantucket where really range has never been an issue. I'm sure you've seen a number of all electric cars popping up on the island. I love these little moats. And Nantucket has three public charging stations, just two fewer than the number of gas stations we have. That's not a bad start. But for the rest of us, while the Tesla is beautiful, I'm guessing that the all electric Ford F-150 signals a major tipping point in transportation electrification. It's not just that the F-150 is the most popular truck in the world or that as a truck, it's not targeted at enviros like me. For my money, it's the imaginative features that Ford is including. Power outlets and a refrigerated front trunk where the engine would normally go. That means you can charge things without having the car exhaust blowing in your face. And we'll never have to worry about ice cream melting before we get home from stop and shop. Just like modern, modern refrigerators, which hold more and use less energy, electric cars are gonna do more and be cleaner. This Ford truck has an option to be able to power your house for up to three days off its batteries. The next time, next time a storm knocks out power to your house, instead of plugging your car into your house, you could plug your house into your car. The other thing I love about this feature is that it gives such a clear picture of how much energy we put into our cars and trucks every time we fill them up. A full tank of gas is about the same as running your house for three days. <clears throat> Before we turn to talking about how we generate electricity, there's one more type of electrification I wanna highlight for Nantucket. And anyone knows my, who knew my father uh, will know that this is, uh, it was dear to his heart. This summer, our landscaper changed to battery-powered hedge clippers. I'd say they make about half the noise when they're running, and there's no generator running to power them. So when they're not running, they're silent. The folks that were using them also said they were better and easier to use. Imagine a Nantucket where we electrify all of the clippers and mowers and blowers. No continuous racket, two-stroke engines and generators, all made possible by the innovations in batteries. And that's sort of the punchline of this long detour into efficiency and electrification. The world is going to change. And if we use our imagination to open ourselves to these changes, they will offer us new and better features, new ways to preserve what we love. And in most cases, they will save us money. So how are we going to power <clears throat> all of these electric appliances. If it's gonna solve climate change, it has to be free of carbon pollution. And that mostly means wind and solar. There are other forms of renewable energy, such as geothermal or hydropower. They're important, but they don't have the potential to grow like wind and solar. The first thing to understand about wind and solar is that they're winning in the marketplace but not fast enough to avoid the worst of climate change. In the last 10 years, coal and nuclear power have declined as a share of our electric mix. It's a little hard to see from this figure, but natural gas and fossil fuels, the blue, I mean, sorry, natural gas, and uh, which is a fossil fuel, but um, has grown about 5%, that's the blue, and then the green renewables has grown by about 6.4%. So it's winning, but not fast enough. I liken our current situation to having dragged a sled up a hill on a snowy day. We're starting to move in the right direction, but if we wanna win the race, we need to do what the bobsled teams do and run and push. And that's what we need our policies to do. Keep pushing renewables forward. When talking about renewables, we generally make a distinction between based on the size and how the power connects to the power grid. 
And there's a continuum. What we commonly call utility scale renewables are larger, tens to hundreds of megawatts, and sell power into the grid at wholesale. At the other end of the spectrum is distributed power. Think rooftop solar. This is generally measured in tens to hundreds of kilowatts and usually connects on the consumer side of the meter, our side of the meter. Generally speaking, utility scale renewables are cheaper and because they're built in large chunks faster. Distributed renewables offer a different economics and a different set of benefits. Like Nantucket versus, Mar versus Martha's Vineyard, there are folks in each camp that think there's only one right type of renewables. But the fact is we need them both. We need a lot of both of them and they're better together. Because of the economics and size, utility scale renewables will probably provide about 90 to 95% of our electricity in the future. A lot more and a lot less and the cost of the whole system goes up. So we really need both the central big stuff and the small distributed stuff. In any case, when you see how much renewables have to grow, you start to understand that we still need an incredible number of solar rooftops. Interestingly, while wind power has been used at small scale by farmers and industry for a very long time, for electricity, utility scale development has been overwhelmingly dominated um, for wind. If you've driven onto the Cape anytime recently, you've seen a good, a uh, few good sized turbines in community scale projects, sort of in between the utility scale and the distributed scale. There are places across the country though, where turbines dot the horizon farther than the eye can see. In Europe, offshore wind has been growing rapidly for over a decade, and it's about to take off at the utility scale here in the US, starting about 20 to 30 miles southwest of Nantucket. You've probably read about some of the controversies surrounding the Vineyard Wind Project, which some Nantucket residents have filed suit against. I'm happy to talk more about this if folk has, folks have questions, but suffice it to say that NRDC negotiated with, with Vineyard Wind to develop what were at the time the strongest protections for the North Atlantic right whale. While the agreement has been superseded by the federal permits, I'm still very proud of the work that went into that agreement. Turning to solar, perhaps the most important thing to know is how fast the solar market is changing. There was a time not too long ago when we talked about solar as a niche technology. It was good for spaceships and remote telecommunica telecommunication towers. Now it is the fastest growing segment of the electric generating market. Prices had tumb have tumbled at a breathtaking rate and deployment has shot up. At the end of 2020, US, the US had installed an installed capacity of 76 gigawatts of solar. 46 gigawatts of that was utility scale solar. 28 was distributed solar. We have two gigawatts of what's known as concentrating solar power. Currently, we're installing about 15 gigawatts of solar a year. And that number is going to almost double in the next few years and then double again by the end of the decade. The slide is from a recent DOE report, it just came out this week, in fact. And it looks specifically at the future of solar as we decarbonize our electricity and beyond. It shows how the annual deployment rate needs to grow for solar, wind, and battery storage. And you can see that doubling that I was talking about there. First, about 15 gigawatts, then going up from there. Just 10 years ago, news of a large scale utility solar project was, well, news. Now it's news when a utility or a town doesn't have a solar project. And unfortunately, Nantucket Town falls into that category. I've only passingly been able to follow the proposal to build a modest sized project on the Wanakamet Water Company land. It seems to me that if it can't be done there, we should move quickly to do it somewhere else. And probably we need to do both build it there and somewhere else. But the price of land on Nantucket makes the absence of a larger solar project less surprising. After all, one thing that larger solar projects do require is land, but a lot less than you might think. 
This slide is from the same study from the Department of Energy and shows the relative land use for the maximum solar deployment um, under the, in the DOE, DOE study. You can see that in the maximum case, DOE finds solar would use about half of 1% of the US surface area. So that's the, the little blue checked box uh, at the lower end of the scale here. Um, but note that that is less than 10% of the disturbed land that is suitable for solar. That's the sort of brown box with the tire track in it. So DOE makes the point that while land acquisition is a challenge for solar, we don't need to sacrifice high value landscapes to meet our solar goals. The broader lesson that, that is in fact at the center of a lot of my work is that while wind and solar are going to take space, mostly on land, but also at sea, we need to make sure we develop renewables responsibly to minimize the impacts on wildlife and yes, our views. And, we and as we struggle to do this balancing, we must remember that it is never gonna be a choice between wind and solar and keeping everything as it is today. The only constant in life is change. And for our lifetime and the lifetime of our children, the climate crisis is going to be driving change. Unless we act aggressively now, it will change wildlife habitat. It will change Nantucket, it will change where plants grow, will, the seas will rise and it will change our coastlines. We can either lead the struggle ourselves and figure out how to do renewables responsibly or get renewables where we don't want them and or suffer the impacts of climate catastrophe. On the bright side, from a wildlife perspective, the more distributed solar we site, the less land we need. And that brings us to rooftop solar. Let's talk again about how much we're gonna need. This slide from the same study shows how much solar we need just to clean up the grid. That's the orange line, getting up to 1600 gigawatts by 2050. This blue dot up here in the corner, upper right-hand corner, shows the scale of what's needed if we're gonna electrify everything we should. So not just the grid of today, but the grid, if we're gonna pull both of those levers I talked about earlier and have all of the cool electric appliances I mentioned. This slide shows DOE's scenarios for distributed solar deployment, the rooftop solar market. You can see that at the moderate end, it's roughly doubling every 10 years through 2040. And at the breakthrough end, Distributed solar is providing almost 10% of DOE's high-end solar deployment target for 2050. There's gonna be a lot of solar rooftops. And like the cool energy efficiency, electric technologies I talked about earlier, these solar systems are going to offer features that we probably didn't imagine were possible. The most obvious on Nantucket is greater reliability. A solar system coupled with batteries can keep your house running when a storm takes out a power line. And solar systems and batteries are gonna do things to help your neighbors and the grid. They can act like shock absorbers for the grid, helping the lights stay on for everyone. And you'll get paid for it. Massachusetts is actually further along in these types of programs than most states. Unsurprisingly, solar has started to take off on Nantucket. I love this map. It's available through the town and shows where all the solar is um, on Nantucket already. And while the chart in the corner here only goes through 2017, there's data through at least 2019. There were 19 residential installations in 2019 alone. That's an annual growth rate of about 45%. I understand we're building a mind boggling 200 new houses a year on Nantucket. If we can keep residential solar growing at 45% a year, by 2028, we'll be adding more solar houses than new houses to the island. And I'm told that those involved in installing solar um, are finding it easier to get it going on Nantucket. My father wanted to put solar on a garage out in Sconset about a decade ago, and was told by the HTC to put it on the ground because a sliver of our garage was visible from the street. He was a stubborn man though, as some of you may know, 
and started to let our hedges grow up to block that public view. In the end, it turned out our roof shingles were partly made of asbestos though, and no solar installer wanted to deal with that. Still, I'm guessing that the folks that own the house shown here, which is also out in Sconset, were also told to keep solar out of sight. Fortunately, the road, which was on the north side, um, and you can see it just beyond the house, um, uh, fortunately, that road is on the north side so that they could put their solar facing south. It's a funny idea, though, that we might be so attached to the concept of shingles that we would tell people they can have asphalt shingles or architectural shingles or even asbestos shingles, but we can't stand to look at solar. And we're not talking about the historic districts here, though these districts are threatened by the, this lack of imagination. And what about solar shingles? Currently, they're expensive and in very limited supply. And the ones I've seen don't look much like historical shingles. Nevertheless, I have no doubt that as the rooftop solar market continues to grow, solar shingles will go mainstream. But recognize this important difference. Solar shingles require replacing your entire roof. So they will always be more expensive than adding solar to an existing roof. I hope eventually we can get a lot of solar shingles in every new building, but we need solar to grow faster. And that means figuring out how to put solar on a lot of existing roofs. And sharing here. I love the historic look and feel of Nantucket. For me, that's about a lot more than shingles or really any single part of a building. And in any case, we're not telling everyone they need to have wood shingles or that they can't have window AC units humming away. We're not really historical purists. So what is the essence of the history we're trying to protect? Use your imagination to try to understand what Nantucket will be like if we keep getting slammed by more and more powerful storms. It's happening all around us. We can also use our imagine, can we also use our imagination to reframe our view of solar? Or more importantly, use our imagination to help the HTC and the selectmen on all of our elected legislators reframe their view of, of solar and of electric vehicles and of electric homes. Can we help them to see solar and the rest of these solutions not as a failure to hold the line against change, which is impossible, but instead as a sign of our commitment to preserve not just our buildings, but our island and our future? And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. That was really excellent. I love, I love the question that you asked at the end, what is it we're trying to protect uh, and to preserve? And I give us a weekly tour of Sconset. And every, every week I am asked, why does the HTC allow asphalt shingles? Uh, people from, from other communities are really surprised. And those of you uh, joining us from off island, you know, we've really strict building um, guidelines here, but tar shingles are up there. Um, so it, it's sort of this incongruity. Um, I wish I could go back in time and ask those um, men who went out to sea for four years at a time to get an energy source. What would they think if they could get energy from their roof? Hmm. Do it. Um, so that's my question. <laughs> But just, if there are any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. We'd be really happy to hear them. That was, I think, really inspiring and such an important point about you know all the different electric um, opportunities out there. And it's interesting just to see what sort of changes or visual intrusions or visual noise we've allowed. You know, cars parked on the streets is, on the sidewalks is definitely one. And why is it that some modern uh, elements of modern life have been more readily accepted than others, I guess. But. Yeah, and I, I think it's, um, it's easy to sort of get daunted by the complexity of how, you know, solar has to be, to be really get the max benefit out of it. We need to think about all the rest of the system and how we're using energy, but um, it's also really exciting. There's just so much, so many opportunities and so much uh, cool ways that we can um, move forward, but it does, 
take sort of embracing change rather mm -hmm. than fighting it. We've got a question um, from Timothy asks, what has the involvement of the Nantucket Conservation Foundation been with respect to solar on Nantucket? Do you have any idea? Oh. Yeah. yeah, that is a good question. I think that, you know, certainly your point about it's gonna require land and open, and open space to do these sorts of things. Um, okay, we've got another comment. From Mary, I completely agree that we are not and can't be purists, and there's no reason to restrict solar wind power on historic aesthetic grounds. Yeah, Mary, that's something I think about a lot is the idea of what is historic preservation, what is aesthetics, and where do the two intersect and where do they diverge? Um, yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, now I really want to buy a moak. <laughs> They're fun. They're probably not for everybody, but they're really fun. Um, and I didn't mean to be endorsing the Ford truck. <laughs> or just the concept this of uh, electric cars coming out and offering features and innovations that we just, you know, it didn't occur to us that you could have a, a refrigerated, they call them a frunk, front trunk. <clears throat> so refrigerated frunk, um, that could be part of a car. Okay, wow, all right, that's a different way of thinking about it. And obviously with the Tesla and the self-driving stuff, you know, that's gonna be, that's not, uh, that's not here yet in the same way as a refrigerator trunk, but um, it's gonna be uh, part of our future. Um, one, one thing you mentioned, uh, the Tesla solar shingles, and I found in my discussions with people uh, who, are really have a put a really high value on aesthetics that that's something that I hear a lot is well they're supportive of solar but they want to see the solar shingles they don't want to see the panels I was told by an installer out here that there's been only one installation of, in Massachusetts of those solar shingles because they're so unavailable yeah have you could you speak a little bit about what you've seen in regards to the shingles well, I, I had a shingle um, on my desk when I started right after college as a prop for um, talking about innovation in solar. Um, and, uh, you know, the technology, uh, that was a long time ago, um, uh, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and the technology really didn't go much of anywhere for, you know, a long, long time. And, you know, I, I think there are other companies, including Tesla, that are, are working on them. I think they, you know, they'll have a place in the market without a doubt. <clears throat> but um, two things I would say, we can't afford to wait. Um, and I think that's uh, sort of, again, a sort of failure of imagination to think, oh, we gotta wait for something that makes me feel like nothing's changing in my world. So, um, or, and then the second thing is just again, recognizing that a lot of people aren't gonna ha be able to afford putting a new roof on their house or, or want to. Um, and so if, we, if Nantucket built its solar plan around requiring something like shingles, they would be requiring a much more expensive approach to this. Um, and I, I think that's fundamentally you know, unfair as well as uh, you know, too slow and, and inefficient. Good. Uh, a couple more questions come in. Um, one. Tim asks, solar promoters seem to aim for installing enough solar panels to completely power your house and pay off the costs in limited time. However, in some cases, it's not possible due to limited roof area or shade. Is it still worth putting up panels if it only partially powers your house? Is there a for figuring out when it's worth it? Yeah, it's... Um... Well, the, the, the utility and the installers should help you do the economics and understand, you know, what the payoff is. That's, that's um, something they are well equipped to do. Um, and, uh, and you should absolutely ask them to do it for you to lay out the economics. Um, and the answer is, yeah, absolutely. You don't need to power your whole house to um, get a lot of the economic benefits these days because you're avoiding every time, every kilowatt hour your solar system generates, you're avoiding buying a kilowatt hour from the utility um, the way it works now. 
Um, and that's that's a pretty good economic deal um, in Massachusetts, where you know power is pretty expensive, <clears throat> and in Kentucky especially. So uh, definitely worth it. Um, if you don't have the whole house, uh, you know, if you don't have enough power for the whole house, um, you can still have batteries that would allow the house to ri ride through a you know a short blip, um, keep all of your electronics running and stuff like that. Um, or you might decide, all right, you know, what we really care about is the refrigerator um, and just uh, pick some appliances and make sure they're on the right circuit. So again, there's lots of options um, to explore there based on you know, what you're, what's, you, you can afford and what your roof can, can accommodate. Great, yeah, I think thinking about solar, not just as part of your everyday life, but as a way to protect your house and your family um, in, a, in a disaster is a really important thing to think about as we look at the increased frequency and duration of uh, intensity of storms. Absolutely. Will asks about solar roadways. Um, how far away are solar roadways? Must be a nice fit for those non-cobbled roads, he asked. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to fix, let's fix the <laughs> um, <laughs> We gotta fix our undulating roads out here. Yeah. Uh, I, I have, uh, watch that technology kind of made a splash and then um, hasn't really gotten much further. Um, I think there's a small demo somewhere in the world. Um, uh, I think the, you know, the lesson I draw from this recent DOE report and that figure I showed you <coughs> um, is that uh, while land is going to be you know, a challenge, uh, it, it's probably not a big enough challenge to make the economics of solarizing all of our roads um, a uh, payoff. Maybe in some uh, specific places, but probably not generally. Um, so uh, I think it's, you know, again, all sorts of innovations are gonna come and probably like most innovations, they'll surprise us when they arrive. Um, but if I had to guess now, solar roadways will, will be a pretty niche uh, niche market. Got one more question. Um, oh, two. Okay, let's see. Very interesting. Mary asks, um, when will we get to where individual installations can sell the power they use instead of being incentivized to only cover their own power use? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and it gets into the, the main policy that we use to encourage rooftop solar uh, today in the United States, which is called net energy metering. And what that basically allows you to do right now is, um, you know, if you think about a normal work day, uh, you wake up, uh, you go to work and your house starts using a lot less energy, a lot less electricity, just as the sun's starting to really shine um, and so you have a lot of excess electricity in the middle of the day. So you export that electricity to the grid. And then when you come home in the afternoon and evening, you get to take, basically sort of take that electricity back, use the credits that you've built up throughout the day. So right now we actually are sort of in a way selling electricity to the grid. And then the grid uses it to power our offices and our, um, all of our, you know, the, the daytime use that we have on the system. Um, there are models where, and, and other countries use this, like Germany, where homes simply sell all of their uh, solar to the grid, um, and they just get paid for it. Um, and so uh, it's like you're just basically a, a small solar project um, happens to be based on your roof. So there are different ways to do it. Right now, we're doing this netting um, where you, you export during the day and, and use in the morning and the evenings. Um, we're probably going to need to continue to evolve our policies um, as we get more and more uh, solar, uh, distributed solar on the system out in California, where they've got um, already got about 10% of their uh, um, load being met by solar in the middle of the day. Uh, they're already having to figure out how to do it and get more value out of it. So make sure it gets installed in the parts of the system that where it provides the most benefit to everybody. And another question from Tim, and I think this will 
Uh, Nantucket Martha's Vineyard and Cape Cod are largely occupied on a seasonal basis. Solar collection during the off-season could be collected in storage batteries and put back into the grid for mainland utility customers. Is that a possibility? Uh, absolutely. You know, um, we also, uh, you know, we have the, the electric um, cables that connect us to the mainland. So even though we may not be using a lot of electricity in the middle of the winter on Nantucket, uh, our solar panels can export it to uh, the mainland just as, as easily as down the road, basically. So um, uh, it's an interest. it starts to get more complicated when we talk about, you know, maybe a third cable to Nantucket and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, my guess is that that's going to happen uh, faster than we want it to because of how fast we're growing. Um, the upside is it means we can electrify a lot of stuff and we can export a lot of solar in the winter. Um, and so it still has a lot of benefit to uh, the rest of the, the world. I love the idea of Nantucket exporting energy again. Yeah, right. Something um, that, that, that well, but, right, something that doesn't require uh, um, killing a yeah. species. Um, anyway. <laughs> It, it is interesting. It's hard not to think about just that 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 line of, um, of of energy collection. You know, I don't know the whalers as that weaves through Nantucket's history and the windmills. Certainly, you know, we did have five windmills at one point on the island, and now we have one, two. I guess if you count the one at the school. <laughs> um, well, this has been really exciting, and I'm so thankful to all of you who joined us uh, this morning relatively early in the morning, I know, and to Nathaniel for his time. I think this was a really ins ins inspiring discussion to get us kicked off. Um, we will be taking a little bit of a break uh, and coming back at 10.15 to hear from uh, Graham at the DPW on Nantucket here to hear, uh, you know, Mary mentioned, um, Mary Longacre mentioned in the chat that anytime you require the replacement of one item with another, you're creating a waste disposal program. And that's a really great segue into some of the topics that we're going to discuss next. Um, so we'll, we will leave uh, <laughs> we will leave the, the chat up and or we will read is going to put up a slide and um, we'll be back together again in a moment. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.